uh, realizing that the uh, Federal Society is not an advocacy organization, I think it's helpful to have this kind of uh, discussion here where we have a lot of competing views and values. I come from Los Angeles where we've been uh, the uh, scene of uh, increased DEA activity, including under the Obama administration, remains to be seen what happens with Eric Holder's new directive to uh, U.S. attorneys as far as uh, prosecutorial, prosecutorial discretion in going after the marijuana dispensaries to the extent that they are legal under Prop 215 under California law. And so I'd like to just raise a couple of issues that are important to Federalists, even though Federal Society is not an advocacy group. Many uh, Federalist members take individual liberty and limited government very seriously. We're against authoritarianism. We tend to be against paternalism. We think that the disease model tends to be a use a uh, rhetorical or a uh, law enforcement device that really goes in the direction of massive government control of people who eat too many McDonald's hamburgers, they drink too much Anchor Steam beer or, or uh, too much bourbon. Uh, so the idea that uh, we have speakers in the range of the panel here who don't like the idea that people in a free society should be entitled to use the substance for re recreational use I think doesn't make, I think if there's a conflict between that approach and the notion of limited government and personal liberty. But the, the ultimate question I would ask is uh, what the general view of the panelists are that over the years of our experience in the United States with tremendous costs, not just peculiar costs of incarceration, but the cost of uh, having people who are incarcerated come out of prisons far worse than when they came in and really become social menaces, even if they don't join the black, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood or things like that, uh, isn't, don't we get it to a certain point that the cure of this war on drugs, whatever we want to call it, that the cure of all these efforts uh, is a, uh, is a uh, that, that that approach is a cure worse than the disease? That directed at me? I, mean, I would answer that very simply, yes. <laughs> The cure is often worse uh, than the disease, and I think it's not only the, um, the consequences of being in prison for the way people um, act thereafter, but it's the consequences of being in prison uh, for the opportunities um, of those persons. Um, if you have a record of imprisonment, you are severely disabled um, in the United States. Um, you're severely disabled uh, almost any place. Um, and uh, your opportunities to get a job, uh, to get a license, to get housing, to get an education um, are significantly harmed by the record that you have. So even if you have, let's say, those marijuana arrests in New York where very few people serve significant amounts of time um, in prison, um, Still, it's the record itself of having been arrested and having been convicted of the possession of marijuana that is the, the real penalty that is uh, suffered by those persons. And I think the rest of us um, suffer as well because if those persons don't get jobs, if they don't integrate themselves into the community, I think they are more of a threat uh, to the rest of us than they would be otherwise. I just want to make a, one quick observation about your question, which is a very fair question, and I appreciate hearing from a fellow Californian. Uh, I underscore the extraordinary importance in this country of civil liberties, and that has really, to me, two dimensions. It has one dimension, which is very much about basic law, about compliance with the Fourth Amendment, and, and achieving that compliance ought to be important to anybody who comes within a thousand feet of federal, state, or local law enforcement, whomever they may be. But beyond that, I think you're raising a deeper question, which is how do we take civil liberties seriously and still engage a problem that many of us and that Republican and Democratic administrations think is an important national problem and that the representatives of the American people have voted over and over again to treat as a big national problem. And I think that is a constant challenge. That is a challenge that deserves vigilance, that deserves debate, that deserves careful discussion about how one policy differs from another, about how you learn from localities. But all that said, I think we ought to be honest with respect to one piece of this problem that is especially complicated, particularly when we want to reconcile a belief in individual freedom 
and uh, commitment to that with the sense of why do the American people come over and over again and say, this is a big problem and we need to have basic state, local, and national standards about it. And I think, honestly, that has a lot to do with the fact this is about kids to some degree and the fact that we're talking about products and substances that affect human judgment. That doesn't settle the question, but it, I'm making this mostly as an empirical descriptive statement of why it is that people struggle with that. Why, why does it people might say, yes, I believe in individual freedom. Yes, I like the idea that people should have room to make choices, including some choices that might not be great for them, but this is tough, this is difficult. And I do think people see it a lot through the lens of, when is my kid ready to make that decision? How can I as a parent face society, even if I'm trying to be responsible and trying to play the role a parent should play, when I recognize this, you know, several of the panelists, Professor Baker, for example, has recognized that I want the federal government to help me set these parameters to some degree, you know, work on the interdiction thing. And I, I don't think that's easy, and I think that's why we're here. Let me just give a sort of another factual blush as somebody who sits at, uh, atop the third branch of government and sees the whole panoply of cases in Michigan. The largest growth in our case filings is in family court. These are abuse, neglect, custody matters. The overwhelming uh, number of them involve a parent who is engaged in some form of drug use. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Um, like Professor Baker, uh, I have been uh, both a prosecutor and now I'm a defense attorney in Florida, so I have a lot of experience with uh, the, the supposed drug war. And I think one of the things we're not addressing here is the profit incentive for the government. Uh, in Florida, which has some of the strictest drug laws in the country, uh, four grams of heroin will get you a 15-year minimum mandatory sentence. My clients routinely walk in, and as long as they cooperate, they are given sweetheart deals, plus they must give up their money, their homes, their planes, and so forth. So basically, once I'm satisfied that uh, there isn't really a Fourth Amendment issue with the case, they all talk, and they have waivers of all these sentences, but the government gets to keep their homes, their, their watches, what have you. And it just seems to me that uh, when we're looking at incentives, uh, there's quite a, uh, I'm not besmirching people's motives, but there is a bureaucratic incentive to seizing uh, my clients of properties. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, if the, if, is the purpose of the drug war, you know, rehabilitation, a moral wrong, or is it to make money? Good point. Anybody want to respond? Okay. I, look, I, I won't claim to have met everybody everywhere, but I've met a lot of people in enforcement, federal, state, and local. Nobody does it for the money. Um, now, they may not turn away the money when there's asset forfeiture and sharing. But basically, I think everybody up here said whether they all mean it or not, it may be another question, they're against major drug dealers. Now, if you can't slam a guy that got a jet off of selling heroin, then I don't think you're serious about stopping the drug problem. So I apologize if that's awkward for your client, but if that's really what's happening, I'm for it. But do you do these on a pro bono basis, by the way? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. I, I make a very good living, but I... But but I, 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 was just I, but I would like to but actually what I would like to do is focus on the other great source of revenue for criminal defense lawyers Medicare fraud but oh. that'll be another topic. All right, <laughs> yes, sir. Is using a small amount of drugs necessarily a victimless crime, and is the answer to that question relevant to how we should think about the drug challenge that our country faces? Okay, sounds like it's addressed to you. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. It, repeat the question. Is the use of a small amount of illicit drugs necessarily a victimless crime? And does, is the answer to that question relevant to how we should think about the drug challenge that our nation faces? I, I don't think the user of a um, small amount of uh, drugs is um, a victim of crime. Um, I think a person uh, can use drugs uh, foolishly. Um, I think that uh, a person can do many things that um, uh, are in disregard uh, of their own health, but I don't necessarily think of the person as a victim of crime. I don't think that a person who smokes a cigarette um, is uh, a victim of crime. No, I meant, is it a victimless crime? Vic victimless. victimless. Um, I, I'm, I'm 
um, in general opposed to criminalizing um, behavior um, which does not injure others. Well, that's precisely my question. Does it injure others? Um, it's, it's hard for me to see how um, someone uh, who acquires um, a small amount of marijuana, say, um, is injuring others. I, I, I can't see it. Well, what if she's a mother? 